I thought it was the only opportunity that we would have to give in-depth case studies on the legal patients. So there's a lot of detail there. I really want to applaud these people and our patient D, uh, who is elsewhere in the country, um, but for their bravery and open, opening themselves up to this process where we dissected their medical history and we examined their lives and we also put it out there for people's scrutiny and approval or di disapproval if they wish. Um, this is just not the kind of thing uh, that everyone has the courage to do. So I, my thanks go to them. Uh, just about uh, a word about the investigators. Uh, besides uh, Mary Lynn and Nell, he, who you've met, um, Juan Sanchez Ramos uh, helped with the study, Rob Valine and Paul Bach are neuropsychologists with me at Montana Neurobehavioral Specialist, and Kristen Curlin uh, now has her PhD in uh, psychology as well, uh, graduating from the University of Montana. We heard about LV and her severe glaucoma. She was another person that was told that she'd be blind within six months, but she has preserved vision in one eye because of uh, her cannabis use. Um, LV's uh, IND was approved in 1988, but she has been smoking for 25 years. Um, she generally uses about eight grams of cannabis a day. Some of that is smoked, some of it is eaten, and hers was 3.8% THC. <coughs> but that's all we know. The government doesn't bother to assay the CBD cannabidiol content, let alone look at terpenoids or other content of their material, so uh, we really don't know what is in it. We have uh, George, patient B, with what's called the nail patella syndrome uh, or Fong syndrome. George um, in, uh, was approved in 1989 uh, and has been using cannabis as medicine for about 27 years. George's intake uh, last year was seven grams of 3.75% THC uh, material and although uh, George is listed as disabled here, uh, George is still uh, an activist, uh, also a very capable handyman, and he's offered to help me with my 30-year-old Kubota tractor when he gets a chance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, patient C is Irvin. Uh, as you heard, he has multiple congenital cartilaginous exostoses, uh, a very painful condition, pain and spasm with bleeding in the muscles. Um, he was approved in 1982 uh, and has been smoking cannabis for actually maybe longer than the 26 years, 31, 31 years. I think what I had asked was, when did you really start using cannabis in a big way uh, to control your symptoms? So there might be a little discrepancy uh, there. Um, Urban has smoked the most, nine grams a day, of the weakest material, and this has been a bone of contention. Basically, his study doctor would be the one that decided what he got uh, for material, and unfortunately, it's been weaker, and he had to smoke more. As you heard, Irvin, despite all this, uh, is a full-time stockbroker and a very successful uh, person. Uh, patient D uh, had multiple sclerosis, has multiple sclerosis, and she has had problems with her balance and walking, also problems with her vision. There were times when her vision would be gone because of the multiple sclerosis. She also suffered from very significant depression. Um, she was a uh, non-cannabis user before this until it was suggested by a variety of people as a possible treatment for her multiple sclerosis. In 1991, she was approved for the program and thus had smoked for uh, about 11 years, nine grams a day of 3.5%. Um, she has been disabled uh, as a clothier, uh, still suffers some visual impairment, but she clearly feels and has had documented that she does see better since she smoked cannabis and feels that she walks better with less spasticity. She also was on a lot less in the way of standard antidepressants than previously. The next slide shows everything we did to the patient. And it's a very considerable list. Basically, what I used as a criterion of inclusion was 
if somebody reported that you got this problem when you smoke cannabis, I wanted to study it, okay? And so that was many different organ systems. Uh, in the olden days, uh, it had been reported that you got brain atrophy, brain rot from cannabis, so we needed to do MRI scans. Obviously, we wanted to look at the lungs. That's the big issue. So we did pulmonary functions and chest x-rays. We did this full battery of neuropsychological tests. We did have to adapt it a little bit because two of our ladies in this instance uh, had visual impairments that affect things like performance IQ. There have been many reports about alleged endocrine sequelae with chronic cannabis use. So we examined that in detail. Probably the largest number of tests that have been looked at uh, for this uh, issue. Again, there have been allegations that uh, cannabis produces immunologic uh, disorders, so we wanted to examine that. We looked at brainwave tests, uh, P300, which I'll discuss a little bit more later, and everyone got a neurologic exam from me. Unlike many studies, the patient smoked during the testing. I know, I walked them out into the parking lot while they toked up. So, uh, any findings that were there are influenced by that fact, that they were using their medicine as per usual. If we look at the results, um, all the patients, A to D, had mild difficulty with attention and concentration. This is what is reported when someone has smoked cannabis acutely. But the same kinds of changes are seen in any group of patients with chronic diseases who are tested. Okay? Particularly, we have patients in pain. Uh, George, in his testing, had to take frequent breaks because of pain or muscle spasm or nausea. He can't stay in one position that long. Uh, needs to have his medicine, uh, needs to walk around. Um, so these kind of changes were mild and should not be a surprise. There was at least a minimal impairment of acquisition of complex new verbal material uh, on the CBLT test. But more important things, executive functions, what we need to plan uh, and what distinguishes us from other uh, animals, uh, these were absolutely normal in two of the four, uh, with milder effects in the other two. There were no depressive symptoms in any of the patients, and I'll have another slide on that. In short, there was nothing that we could pin as to changes due to cannabis in this cohort of patients. Um, we really put them through the ringer, so to speak. Uh, this is George about to have his MRI scan. This actually is Urban's. Uh, this is a very clean looking cut. He did have non-specific changes that had nothing to do with cannabis on other cuts, but this is particularly interesting for how clean the white matter is. When a person is Urban's age, very often they have what the radiologists uh, call UBOs, unidentified bright objects mild changes uh, in the white matter that can be due to things like hardening of the arteries or other uh, difficulties, but we didn't see any such thing in any of the four patients. We used a standard machine, standard protocol, a 1.5 Tesla patient A. LV had age-compatible atrophy, meaning that as we age, um, we expect a certain amount of brain shrinkage. Um, but again, talk to LV. I think she's the youngest person I know on many levels, and uh, she's not lacking for any uh, mental acuity. Um, George, George has had a checkered career. He's really been around, done a lot of things, but he had a scan that was read as perfectly normal. I mentioned uh, Urban scan already. Uh, patient D has MS, and there have to be changes. Uh, in multiple sclerosis and MRI, the brain shows changes 98% of the time. That's how we often define the disease. But the key thing here is that over time, uh, patient D has fewer multiple sclerosis plaques visible on her MRI scan than she did before. She is not on interferon uh, treatment, and really, in terms of a protective agent, cannabis is her only medicine. Thus. 
there were no imaging changes uh, attributable to cannabis.